We're in part four of a series called, What Do You Do When There's Nothing You Can Do? And of every series I've ever preached in my life, honestly, in front of God, I've never had so many people come to me and say, this series is just for me. I've never had so many people come and say, you prepared this just for me and for nobody else. And the title says it all, because we've all either been in a situation, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? Or we know someone going through it, or maybe we're preparing because we're about to be in one of those things before we know it. And what it is, for those who haven't been here, this is when there's a situation where you're just, you're stuck. Okay, you prayed, you fasted, you tried, you planned, you talked to doctors, you did your research, and you're stuck. And at some point in time, you just have to accept that it is what it is, and it's not going to change. My marriage is what it is, and I hate it, and I've tried everything, and I'm not going to walk away from it, but I guess this is just what it is. This is just my new reality. Okay, this is the, the job situation. I have these career aspirations and dreams of what I'm going to do and all these different things. And, and it's just, not only it's not going to be, it can never ever be. This is just the way the health is going to be. This is the way the family is going to be, so on and so forth. Now, here's the important part, and I mentioned this last week, but I want to stress on this a little bit. When you're in one of these situations, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? It's not just a challenge in your marriage. It's not just a challenge in your family. It's not just a challenge in your career. It's a challenge of your faith. Because inevitably, what is going to happen when you're in that situation, inevitably, you're going to ask yourself the question, how could God allow blank? Like, I understand why God may have allowed it to her, or her, or maybe him. But I'm the guy who's in church every week. Like, where are you? I know the miracles, and I know that you answer, and I read the story of Lazarus, and I know, and I know, and I know. And soon, it leads to, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, it leads me to say, I'll never be happy ever again. Nothing good can ever come from this, and then we give up and say there's no point in trying. But here's the problem, if you've ever said any of those things. Here's the problem, and it's an inescapable problem. As much as you want to say no good can come from this, God has left me. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pack up and go home. I'm gonna quit on this whole God thing. There are people out there whose lives judge us. There are people out there whose lives tell us. There are people out there whose lives are really tough and really bad. And they're kind of situations when you hear, like you're inclined to think my situation is so bad my situation is so hard that I, no one has it harder than me. And then you hear someone else's story and you're like kind of embarrassed to tell your story because their story is like really, really hard. And then all of a sudden, they actually don't give up. They actually don't stop loving God. That you don't stop believing in God. Actually, their faith gets stronger. They, they somehow thrive in it. And all of a sudden, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I thought... Because this, this, and this, I'm giving up on God. But then I see somebody who's in a worse situation. They're not giving up on God. They're actually closer to God. They're thriving. They're proving that there is no conflict. This is important. There is no conflict, sometimes in our mind. There's no conflict between God's love and care for me and God's cooperation with me. Say that one again. There's no conflict between God's love for me and his cooperation with me. And parents, we get this. We love our kids. The fact that we don't cooperate with their will, gimme, 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 gimme candy, let me stay up, let me drive at age 12, we don't give, we don't cooperate with their will, doesn't negate our love for them. But somehow when it comes to me and God, if you love me, you'd give me what I want. If you cared about me, you'd cooperate with my will. I believe that the times that you feel God is working the least, actually he's working the most. The times that you feel God has left me, actually he's never been more with you. But you got to do something about that in order to realize it. And as we talked about a couple weeks ago, is you have an option, you don't have to do it because you have a tough situation, no one's going to guilt you or force you. But you have the option when you're in a trial and adversity to embrace it as a gift with a purpose. You don't have to. You can be miserable. 
You can complain. You have that right. You're in a tough situation. No one can make you feel bad about it. But you have the option. St. Paul talked about it. You have the option to embrace it as a gift with a purpose. And when you do that, something unique happens, something mysterious. God unleashes his grace in your situation. And that's why we saw last week St. Paul say, because I embrace it as a gift, then truly I have learned the mystery, the secret of being content, whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What St. Paul said is, nothing on this earth can shake me because I've learned the secret. When you embrace it, gift with a purpose, nothing can shake you. And it's not just St. Paul. Like I was reading recently about the early church. You know the early church like in the book of Acts, okay, the first century church. You know the book of Acts church started as a very, very small church, very small. Like the number of people in this room, it's probably like the initial meeting was even less than this. But then eventually started to grow and started to grow and started to grow. But you realize they were a small church with no political power, no power in any capacity, and they were hated by everybody. So you have the Romans, the Roman Empire, they hated them because they preached an atheism as far as they were concerned. Christianity preached atheism. Before Christianity preached atheism. Because Romans said there's many gods, Zeus and whoever else, and Christianity said, no, none of those are gods. So that you guys are atheists, we hate you. You don't believe in our gods, we hate your guts. And, and, and every time there was you know, a natural disaster, it would be it's because you Christians don't believe in gods, so therefore the gods are angry at us. So these guys hated them. On the religious side, they had the Jewish authorities. And the Jewish authorities hated them as well. Everyone who was in power wanted to get rid of them. But no one could squash them. And they kept spreading. Why? Because they understood this principle. Because adversity didn't shake the early church. In fact, it fueled the early church because they saw no conflict, as I said, between God's love for and God's cooperation with. When we're in that situation, we are tempted to think, well, what, can, what do you know what can do? We're tempted to say, God is absent, God is apathetic, and God is angry. That's what we're tempted. We saw in week one, no, God is not absent, God is not apathetic, God is not angry, God is with us. Repeat after me, God is not absent. I want to hear you in Arlington as well. Repeat after me, everybody. God is not apathetic. God is not angry. He is with us. He's Emmanuel. You can start repeating now. Okay? That's what Emmanuel means. And you remember the name Emmanuel. That's what they said on Christmas night. You will have a child, and his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. Christmas is the perfect picture of what we're talking about. Because when Jesus was born, heaven came down to earth. No more powerful day in the history of the world. Of all the days that preceded Christmas, there was no day where God was working more powerfully than Christmas Day. Everybody agree? And the whole world knew nothing about it. It was darkness. It was like we sing in the song. It was a silent night. And as far as you knew, it was like any other night. But God was working more powerfully. James is a great book because it's very short. It's five chapters. Probably it's like three pages. So you could sit down in about 15, 20 minutes and read the entire epistle of James. And it's full of practical advice about many different topics. But first, before we look at what he says, let's try to understand who James is because I think when you understand the context, you understand it a little bit better. James is a very popular name in the New Testament. When it comes to the 12 apostles, how many of them are named James? Two. Okay, and if you've been watching The Chosen, they call them Big James and Little James. I don't know if they actually called them that. I like it. It's kind of easy. The scripture identifies them as James. They only were given first names at that time. So then you had to identify by their parents. So you had James, the son of Zebedee. Okay, and James, the son of, the other end of the alphabet, Alpheus. Okay, I don't know what anybody said, but let's just pretend you said Zebedee and you said Alpheus. So James, the son of Zebedee, he was the brother of John. James, son of Alpheus. You also had another James who was sort of associated with the apostles. You had two guys named James. You had two guys named Judas of the apostles. The bad guy Judas, and then the good Judas, who is identified as Judas, son of, James. 
Now, you never think of that other Judas because, because this guy was named Judas. No one wants to have his name. You can understand that. Like, who would want to be named Judas? So he's given different names. So he's Jude, okay? Or if you're watching The Chosen, he's also called Thaddeus sometimes or Labaius. Basically, they called him everything, every name in the book except Judas, basically, because no one wants to be called Judas. None of those Jameses are the James who wrote the epistle. There's a different James. And this James is called James the Just, and he had a unique position. He had two unique positions in Christian history. Number one, he was the Bishop of Jerusalem, the first Bishop of Jerusalem. So if Jerusalem was kind of like, you know, HQ1, all right, he was the Bishop of it. And the second position, the more unique one, is that he was the brother of the Lord. That's how he's called in the New Testament. Now, just kind of a, a side note, and then we'll get into the epistle of James. When it says brother of the Lord, it doesn't mean brother like sibling brother. And I know there's a lot of people today who think that James is the sibling brother of Jesus, because that's what the New Testament says, sibling brother of Jesus. But we know that Jesus didn't have any siblings. He didn't have brothers or sisters in, that, in the way we use that word. They, in the, in the biblical times, used the words brother to mean different things. So it could mean cousin or it could mean half-brother. And you say, but it says brother. So I'm going to believe it says brother. And you guys are trying to pull the wool over our eyes and brother. Okay, just so you know, if you think that Jesus had a brother, that, that St. Mary wasn't ever virgin, okay, that virgin before his birth and after his birth, then you would be in a very, very, very elite category of people. A very, very small minority of people. Elite, I put in the air quotes. I didn't mean it. It meant sarcastically. Okay? That for thousands of years, we've had Christianity for 2,000 years. And did you know, for 1,800 of the 2,000 years of Christian history, nobody at all ever came up with this idea that Jesus had brothers and sisters. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that someone said, Wait, when it says brother, I think it means sibling. That's the equivalent. The first 1800 years, they knew, Jesus' disciples knew that brother meant cousin or half-brother. And his disciples, his disciples, his disciples, and even notice, I said 1800s, if you're thinking the Protestant Reformation, that was the 1500s. The Protestant reformers, like people like Martin Luther, were not saying that St. Mary didn't have that, other children. That, again, that concept didn't come in until the 1800s. That's the equivalent of today, 1,800 years later. I say, my sister Claire. You say you hear me after, say, my sister Claire. Okay? My sister Claire. And everyone who knows me knows I don't have sisters. I got two brothers, but no sisters. And you know that, and your mother knows that, and everybody knows that. But then let's say 1,800 years from today. Somebody do the math. 1,800 plus 2024. A lot of years. Let's hear 4,000 something or other. Okay? 3,900 something or other. Somebody shows up in the year 3924 or 3824 and says, no, Father Anthony had a sister. You say, no, nobody said sister. No, I heard that it was written that he said Sister Claire that one day. So if you think that after 1800 years you discovered a mystery, we just clap for you because you're very intellectually elite. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to James. Rant over. James, we don't read about him being a believer in Christ during the life of Christ. We don't read about him coming to faith until after Christ's life. Maybe he was before, just not written, or because, like I said, he was the half-brother of Jesus, or the cousin, but most likely the half-brother. It's a lot harder, like it's harder to convince somebody that somebody they knew when they were younger was actually God. Like somebody you meet, you can say, okay, but somebody that you were there and you played Legos with him and he built the thing and you took his red, he took your blue and he ate the crayon, whatever. Like somebody who saw little baby Jesus, little toddler Jesus and little whatever, maybe that's why it was harder for him to come to faith. I don't know. But for whatever reason, he didn't become a leader till later. But when he did become a believer, he became an instant leader in the church, Bishop of Jerusalem. Life in Jerusalem during the first century, as I mentioned, church was persecuted. Okay, so he oversaw a church that was beaten down by the Romans, beaten down by the Jewish, the civic and the religious. So he had a very unique position. He was talking to a bunch of people who were going through a very, very difficult time with, here's the important part, listen carefully, no hope of it getting better. He was talking to people in a very difficult time, a persecuted people with no hope Christianity wasn't going to get an army one day and overtake the Romans, okay? The people who are persecuted, and James eventually was martyred, 
Okay, getting beaten with clubs. This is who he's talking to. Now let's read his epistle. James chapter 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James doesn't waste any time. This is chapter one. This is when most people are like the greetings and the salutations and uh, can't wait to come see you. He jumps straight in. And he tells us, in this verse, we're going to look at this verse and we're going to go back and break it down. He tells us why we're in trials, why we go through adversity. Remember I said earlier, God is working, but what is God doing? He gives us the answer right here. And he says that the intended outcome of your trial is perfection. But the path to that outcome is patience. The intended outcome of your trial, your adversity, is your perfection. You may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. But the path to get there is patience. Let's start with the outcome, the goal. I say perfection. God's goal for you is perfection. What does perfection mean? It doesn't mean sinless. Okay, because it's kind of too late for that okay that, 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 that train has left the station okay once you've committed a sin you can no longer be perfect in that sense perfect don't think of it as perfect in the sense of like never made a mistake perfect meaning i'm going to use the word maturity that's what he's saying that you may be perfect that you may be complete that you may reach spiritual maturity and he says this is the goal of everything that we do and again many of us today American Christianity is very much focused, and this is all of us too in the church as well. The longer you've been in church, the more you may be tempted to fall into this. We focus very much on spiritual birth and not enough on spiritual growth. We're focused very much on when were you born in Christ? And when did you believe? And when did you enter? And when did you... But we talk about birth, but we talk very little about growth. In any area of life, there's always a gap between the two. There's no area of life that you're born and you're perfect. At the, like you don't go in on first grade and then you graduate the next day. That doesn't happen in any area of life. Same is true spiritually. Maturity in the spiritual realm takes, it's a process. It takes effort. It takes time. And what, what he's going to tell us, it takes patience. So another way of saying it, you must endure to mature. It takes time doesn't happen overnight and again think about it if God look at it from God's perspective we a lot of times talk about that God has promises and a rich inheritance for us as his children if you had a rich inheritance if you wanted to leave a million dollars to your descendants would there be any conditions to that for example you have a child who's four years old would you give it to the child if you had a million dollar inheritance? Would you give it to him at age four? You would wait until he or she is mature. You buy a car, like I want to give my kid a car, but you don't buy it for them at age 10 because they're not mature enough to handle it. So in order to reach the outcome, to have the reward, you have to first go through the process of maturity. Well, the same thing is true. I'm going to say something right now, and I don't like it. You don't like it, but it's the truth. All the promises of God, all the promises of God, all the promises of God are based on our spiritual maturity. You can't just take a promise from the scripture about peace that surpasses all understanding and joy that nobody can steal from you. Those are all based on us growing and us maturing. And when we refuse the process of maturity, you know what we do? We negate the promises of God in the, in the process. Said another way, many of us, every year we get spiritually older, but that doesn't mean we get more spiritually mature. It's like the kid, it's like the kid if you ever, okay, the kid, uh, the eighth grader, okay, who are the, the, yeah, the eighth grader who's on his like fifth year in eighth grade, six foot six eighth grader, something like that. And that's the way some of us are, like we're just sitting in the same class, the same class, the same class, and everyone else is going this way, you know, and we getting older, but we're not getting more mature. Okay, what is the definition of maturity? 
How would you define maturity? I have my own little definition right here, and it's kind of coming from right this, from, from, from what St. James says. Parents, I, I think you might agree with me. Let's say you got two kids. Two kids, and they're both hungry. But now you are, like you're driving wherever it is, so there's no food in the car, and it's not the appropriate time, you can't pull over. You got two kids who are hungry, and you say to them both, no food. How would a mature, well, let's start with immature, how would an immature child respond? Tantrum. No. Gimme, 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 gimme. I need it right now. I need it, I need it, I need it. Ah! And a mature child would say, Dad, I'm hungry. I'd like to pull over. Wish I could eat, considering eating my sock right now. However, if it's not the appropriate time, I am willing to wait. That's a mature child. That's an immature child. Do you want me to ask you which one God would call you? If I asked heaven right now, this child, this child, this child is the one who can wait or the temper tantrum child? That's maturity. The one who's able to wait, the child who's mature, you name it. My inheritance is yours because you're mature, because you can wait. Anything you need, I got it for you. I may not give it to you right now because you're, you understand, but there's nothing that child will lack. That's why St. James, patience, the intended outcome, perfection, maturity. The intended, sorry, the path to that intended outcome is patience. Let's go back now and break it down, okay? We're gonna go verse by verse quickly. Starting in verse 2. Okay, I know we're behind on time, so we're going to go quickly right here. Verse 2. St. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Let's try to understand what this means, because this is a strange-sounding verse. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials? How am I supposed to, I'm supposed to be happy? No, no, no. I'm not saying be happy. Let's understand what does the word count mean? And try to understand it literally. Because I think if you understand the literal meaning of count, you'll be able to understand the spiritual meaning St. James is trying to tell us. So count sounds like accountant. Do we have any accountants here? Any, any accountants? Nobody is an accountant? That's, oh, some. Okay, just shy. Like, of course, accountants, they count the cost before they raise their hand. Okay, very good. Okay. <laughs> so what does an accountant do? An accountant... There's no emotional involved for accountants, right? Right, spouses of accountants, there's no emotions in accountants. What an accountant does is you give me this charge and it's my job to count it or classify it or label it in a certain category. Do you give me this? And I say, count that as an expense. Count that against that, uh, 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 that, that whatever, that, that category. Count that, it means classify or label. That's what James is telling us to do right here. He's saying, I realize you may not be happy about this trial, but when a trial comes, you can make a decision, an unemotional decision, to classify it, to put it in a certain bucket. I'm telling you, again, this expense, count it against that budget. I'm telling you, when you get this trial, count it as joy. Meaning what? Meaning usually you get the trial and you count it, you classify it as, end of the world. I have an end of the world bucket, put that one in there. End of my life, put it in there. Life's never going to be good and I put it in there. St. James is saying, when you have that come to you, I understand you got to put it in a bucket. I want you to put it in a bucket called source of joy. And you say, with all due respect, Father Anthony, you may be talking about somebody who got a little itsy bitsy little child. You don't know my child. You don't know what I'm going through. And what I say to you is, hold your horses. We're only on verse two. Let me get through the next few verses and see if you change your mind. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Verse three, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, here's another, this expression, the testing of your faith. This should be the first like glimmer of, wait, there's some good news coming right here. 
What James is telling us is that this trial that you're going through, listen carefully to this one. This trial that you're going through, I wish I could say this like, this trial that you're going through is bigger than the trial. It's bigger. There's more at stake. It's not just about your happiness these next 10, 20, 15, 30 years you're on this earth. It's not just about money. It's not just about marriage. It's not just about your five-year plan. That's what you think. And I get it because it's hard when you're in the storm to see it. But my job as a priest is you come to me with a storm. You come to me with a trial. And my job is to stand outside it and to tell you, I get it. It's hard. But you know, if you look at it from this angle, you know, you can see that there's more to the story than meets the eye. You see just the pain and the suffering. But what you don't see is maybe God is using this. Using, using the technical difficult. There we go. He's using this. That means I'm saying something good. I'm about to say something good. He's using this to build this, to do something. When you're in a trial, actually your faith is what's on trial. And actually I'll say something I don't even agree with, but I'll say it and I gotta be honest. It sounds even bad to what I say. Your faith is on trial, God is on trial as well. You're testing God. Your faith. You looking at it, just the situation. James, talking to people 2,000 years ago, saying, guys, I know we're being persecuted. I know it's hard. I know someone just lost loved ones. I know your mom just died. I know your sister. I know they just took your husband. I know. I know they fired you from your job. I know they've shunned you. I, I know. But guys, something greater is happening here. Something greater is happening here that 2,000 years from now, can you imagine, this is James saying it to them, can you imagine 2,000 years from now, there's gonna be a group of people over in Leesburg or in Arlington, I see you over there in Arlington as well. There's a group of people in Leesburg or in Arlington, cities that don't even exist at the time. And they're going to be reading about us and they're going to find courage and strength and inspiration from us. There's more to the story. And you don't know, you don't know who or what hangs in the balance of your adversity and your response to it. You're thinking just me, 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 me. And James is saying, count it all joy, knowing that this testing produces patience, that there's something greater happening here. And as I've already said, that this patience is gonna be good for us. Verse four. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, what James is saying here is that God is trying to build your faith. And real faith isn't, I had a hard day, like I got fired on Monday, I won the lottery on Wednesday. I believe very hard. Look at me, I'm so, that's not faith. Faith is, I got fired on Monday, my car, I went to the shop on Tuesday, and I don't know how I'm gonna eat on Wednesday. That's faith. Real faith is when you're in a trial, no solutions, and you say, I know my God is with me. I know my God didn't leave me. I know my God is working a greater purpose for this. I hate this, but I embrace it as a gift with a purpose. Like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, remove this cup from me, but if it's your will, then I embrace it and I accept it. That's the path to perfection. And if I had to give it to you in one quick thought of, as to why you should, like, why should I believe that, Father Anthony? Why should I believe God is with me? Why should I believe? Why should I believe? I'm going to tell you it's easy. And I'm telling you, if there's one thing that sometimes I just want to scream in people's face, not in like a scream angry, but screaming like ingrain this in your head. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. Trying to build some suspense for it. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. I want you to ingrain this in your head. Because this is the key to being faithful in trials and adversities. And it is God has a plan. God has a plan. God has a plan. 
I'm, even if it feels good to say, repeat after me, say, God has a plan. That's the most pathetic God has a plan I've ever heard in my life. That's people who don't believe that God has a plan. God has a plan. Say it. God has a plan. It has to be what we say at all times. When something happens, God has a plan. When the car broke down, God has a plan. Person sick, God has a plan. AV won't work. Cameras won't work. Microphones keep going off. God has a plan. If you don't believe that, then you're going to walk away. You're going to quit. You're going to give up. But when you realize that he's the master, he's the good shepherd, he's got a plan. I don't have a plan. When the streaming guy said it doesn't work, I'm like, I don't know. What should we do, Father Anthony? You're in charge. I don't know. I don't have a plan. But God has a plan. And when things fall apart, this is, this is, this is the lifeline. This is what we only that we hold on to. Is that God, I don't know what's happening. Everything's falling apart. But you have a plan. Because I'm out of options. But answer me this question. Is God ever out of options? Is God like... I don't know. That's a good one. Never thought of that. Is God ever painted into a corner? No. God has a plan. And I could bring you verses. Okay, this is actually, I could bring you 10 verses, 20 verses. I could bring you verses from Jeremiah chapter 29 that talked about how that I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans. You don't know nothing. I know the plans. Stick with me. I know the plans. I can bring you verse from Isaiah chapter 55. Talk about how my ways are not like your ways and my thoughts are like your. Mine are higher. I don't want to give you all those verses. I'm just trying to sneak them in right now. But I'm going to give you one verse. And if you hold on to this verse, if you understand what this verse says, this comes from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. And it says this. Listen carefully. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, meaning don't give up. Do not become sluggish, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Who through what? Who through, say it with me, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In other words, two criteria, faith and patience, faith and patience, faith and patience. You got these two, you're good to go. You got faith, I know God is working, I believe he has a plan, I believe he's almighty. Faith, 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 and now patience. So usually, like, I feel like we're good at the faith one, okay, because we know the miracles and we know the stories. So we're good at, I believe, I believe, I believe. And then lunchtime comes and nothing happened. So we kind of let go and we stop believing. You need both. You need to believe and be patient. You need to be patient but you also need to believe. The one who has faith and patience is unstoppable. Unstoppable in life. Nothing can stop this person. I'll give you an example. Let's go back to my rich man analogy from earlier. Let's say you're a rich man and you have a child, four-year-old child, three-year-old child, and you send that child to school every day and the kid, okay, whatever, whatever with the kid. And then you tell the kid, hey, son, you know, you're the richest kid in the world. And not like in an arrogant, like bragging kind of way, but you're just trying to tell them, you're the richest kid. And the kid's like, dad, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm in this room with all these other kids. I'm not any richer than them. We're all sitting on the same floor. We all, you know, get spanked when we mess up. We all eating Cheerios, like dirty Cheerios, like from under the couch or whatever it may be. How do you say I'm rich? What would you say to that child? What would you say to that child? You'd say, faith and patience, baby. Faith and patience. Believe in me that I'm your dad and I'm rich and be patient. Wait till you're mature. Faith and patience. Faith and patience. The one who has faith and patience will inherit everything from the Father. So I'm going to say it this way. I'm going to say whatever it is that is unplanned in your life, and every one of us has unplanned. Nothing is outside of God's plan. Nothing is outside of God's ability to control and ability to bring good from. And I believe that right now, when you're in the what do I do when there's nothing I can do moment, it may seem like God is far. It may seem like God is angry, God is absent, God is apathetic. But I believe this. 
I believe that the greatest tension in your life right now is exactly where God will work the most in this coming year. And you hate my guts for saying this, and I hate myself for saying it, because I don't want to believe that. But the truth, the area that God is going to work most in your life and my life is not the areas where everything is great. Not the areas where everything is on track. It's the area that you are actively pushing away, the area that you are running from, the area that you are praying would just be that area. I believe that's where you'll find God the most in this coming year. And I'll give you an example. Everybody know the story of Moses when he crossed the Red Sea, how God parted the Red Sea. The end of the story of the Moses is beautiful, but I often think about the time leading up to the parting of the Red Sea. Because there you got Moses. God promised, I'm going to take you out of this place. I'm going to take you to a, a, a new land and freedom. And he did the whole let my people go thing. And he led the people. And they're out in the wilderness. And it's freedom. And, you know, we're going to be great. And then all of a sudden, the bad guys, here come the bad guys. The bad guys were not happy that you escaped in the middle of the night. And as far as they know, you killed all of their firstborn children. The bad guys are not happy with Moses. So now you're running, okay, and you're carrying all your stuff on your back. And they got horses, and they got chariots, and they got weapons, and you're in big trouble. And then all of a sudden, you're Moses, you look to the left, and you got mountains. You look to the right, you got more mountains. You look in front of you, you got the Red Sea. And you look behind you, you got bad guys. So you say, uh oh, I am trapped. I'm trapped. Nowhere to go. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? So you pray, and you pray, and you say, God, I believe. Faith and patience. I believe that you're going to heal or free us. I believe. I believe. So, Lord, send us an airplane now. Or, Lord, send us a, a helicopter for two million people now. Or, Lord, build a bridge over the Red Sea now. Or, Lord, I got a, a creative one for you. You said the whole move a mountain thing? Want to pick up these mountains and move them out the way? Better. Pick them up and put them on top of the bad guys. Like, you got lots of options. I believe. I believe. I believe. And they're marching towards that Red Sea. And none of those things is happening. God is answering none of those prayers. Zero. And then all of a sudden, they get up to the front. And you say, God, I'm trapped. Mountains here, mountains here. Bad guys, the worst thing. You, if you're Moses, you would say, the worst thing that can be in front of me is an ocean. The worst thing. And God says, just hold your horses. Because what ended up being the worst thing ended up being the best thing. So what did God do? Just a little, pulled a little something out of his pocket called split the ocean in half, split the Red Sea. So that Moses walked through the Red Sea and there said there was a wall of water on his left and his right. A wall of water. Sometimes we just read these things as if they're just easy, okay? It wasn't like he was walking through a puddle. He's talking about walking through the ocean. Like, and there's like a mirror right there like, you know what I mean? Like, like doing his hair in the mirror. And he's just walking straight through it. And that became the means of his salvation. And then the bad guys, as they followed him, that became the means of their death. The thing that Moses was saying, God, give me anything except an ocean. Give me anything except a Red Sea. Give me anything except what's in front of me. You think Moses would say that now? Looking back, Moses would say the best thing that God gave me was the very thing that I was running away from. <clears throat> the greatest tension in your life right now is exactly where God will work the most in this coming year. I believe that. But we'll wrap this thing up right here. James says that's not easy to do. So there's a key quality that everyone needs to have. And if you don't have it, James says, it's okay, you can pray for it and God will give it to you. That's the next verse, verse 5. He says, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. James is being realistic. He's saying, I know what I'm just saying is not easy. That's why, by the way, it's the measure of perfection, not the measure of mediocreness. He didn't say that you may be mediocre, like, just like everybody else. So he's saying, ask for wisdom. What's wisdom? Here's the definition I came up with for wisdom. I believe that wisdom is the ability to see current circumstances in a greater context. 
Would you agree with that? Parents, again, we get this. Wisdom means that you can see things bigger than they are. So when you're a parent, your kids run home after school, and your kids are like, it was the worst day ever, it's the end of the world. You know, because, you know, little, little, little Joey knocked the books out of my hand and I'm just, I, my life is over, I can never go back to school. And as a parent, you're thinking what? Nobody cares. You know, like, we, we, like we care because we're supposed to care, but in the end, we don't really care. Nothing's gonna happen. Your books are gonna fall again, okay? Or uh, I struck out, okay, I struck out in, 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 in T-ball. You say it's the end of the world. You're like, don't worry, son. You're going to strike out plenty of times in life. This is far, not going to be the last one by any means. But you pretend to care, whatever it may be. But in the end, you're like, it's not that big a deal. I believe that's what wisdom is. I believe that wisdom is when something happens to you. And we're like, it's the end of the world. My life is over. Never be happy. It's okay. You'll get through. In fact, worse stuff is probably going to happen to you down the road as well. That's wisdom. As St. James says, is pray that God gives you wisdom to be able to see that. And think about it. James telling us to pray for wisdom in trial. This is different than how we usually approach trials. Actually, I know a person, this is a true story, where someone was sick in the hospital. They were in a bad situation. A lady whose husband had died, and now she was sick and in a lot of pain and probably near the end. And someone was visiting her, like uh, some people from church were visiting her. And they were saying, you know, we're praying for you, we're praying for you, we're praying for you. So the lady responded and said, what are you praying for? And people were like, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. Hey, we're praying for you, praying for you. So they said, we're praying that God gives you strength. And she said, don't pray that he gives me strength. Pray that he gives me the wisdom to make the most of this trial. You know what that is? That's maturity. That's spiritual maturity. And that's what James is telling us is available to us. James wraps this thing up right here, verse 12, and says, the one who can do that, blessed is the one. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This is my prayer for all of us, that we would receive that crown of life which the Lord has promised. How we're going to get there? Testing your faith produces patience. But if you got patience and you got faith, that you can receive all the promises that God has in store for us. And if you want a way to make that practical, you can put a, a small little prayer up here on the screen. It's also in your handout. If you've got the handout, it's also in the app. But here's a little prayer that you can hold on to to help you get one step closer to that. And it says this, God, let me see as you see. Wisdom. Let me see as you see. Greater context. Help me to believe that you will use it until you choose to remove it. May God help us all, give us the wisdom to be able to see what he sees, to endure, because that's the only path to mature, and maturity is ultimately the path to receive the reward that God has in store for all of us. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you because we know that no matter what happens to us in this world, that you have a plan. I pray that you would help us to cling to you and cling to that plan, trusting, Lord, that even when things are out of our control, it's never out of yours. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints. Here, as we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. See you next week.